Today I wanted to share with you uh, a bit of history about how I got started with group spaces. Um, so set it up in my final year at uni. And then also some lessons that I've learned along the way about coming up with ideas for startups, um, about marketing and what I think that really means and what I think that could mean for your startups. And if we've got time, some, uh, some tips on fundraising, uh, some of which I've stolen from one of our investors called Dave McClure, um, and it should really have a, a rating above the age of 18 on it, but we'll see. So, a bit of background about me, so 25 now, when I was at uni, um, I was doing a master's degree up in Oxford, and I wasn't, in my first year, I wasn't really sure exactly what path I wanted to take in my career, so I thought I'd try some internships, um, and I'd try starting a company and see what happened. Uh, in my second year, or oh, sorry, in my first year I did some stuff at Lima Brothers um, and got a job with them, which it turned out to be a very smart move not to take. Uh, and then in my second year I did uh, some stuff in consulting and banking and, and much like Rich described, um, it's difficult to get excited for me personally about those sort of careers. Um, you're one of thousands of people, this tiny cog in this massive wheel. Um, you can't have much impact in the world yourself. Uh, it's quite a long slog. Versus startups where you've got complete freedom, you can change the world, you get excited every day, and you know, yeah, it's just a no brainer. Um, so, starting Group Space in October 07, and where the idea came from was I was um, on different clubs and society committees at Oxford. I was uh, treasurer of the Motor Racing Society and captain of the Table Tennis Club, that's how cool it was. Um, anyway, and it was a complete pain in the ass to manage all of the admin for clubs and societies. So the typical situation that, that these clubs are in were that um, they had all these different things to do. They've got um, the membership database for the club is sitting on an Excel file on treasurer or secretary's laptop somewhere. They need to send out emails to market their events like this one. They're using the university server email list, Outlook, Gmail. They're collecting money for, for membership subs, um, for tickets for events, that's why cash check given to the treasurer, he's got to go back and forth from the bank, she's going back and forth from the bank, it's a nightmare. They need a website, someone builds it one year, they graduate, the website goes out of date for like three years, someone else comes along who knows something about building websites, builds another one, files are all over the place, when you hand over at the end of the year, stuff all gets lost, it, it's just a disaster basically. Um, until group spaces. Uh, and so what we did was build this all-in-one set of tools to, to make it really easy to organise a club or society. Um, so you guys probably have, have seen some of that works, but bringing all these things together into one place. And a couple of key differentiators or product design decisions that we made that are relevant for all, all products that you'll create are that we, first of all, um, only require the leader of a group to create a user account and sign up. Um, all of the members of a group can just get imported by their email address or from an Excel file. And so what that's, this is doing is removing the barrier to entry for signing up to the service, something that Rich talks about as well. So the, the key principle here, and it's particularly relevant with um, software and mobile applications, is that you want to make it super easy for a user to sign up. If you put the bar too high, people won't jump over it and sign up for your service. If you bring it down as much as possible, more people will sign up, which is obviously no brainer for you. Secondly, in, on the same theme, um, we integrate with the way group currently functions. So we're not trying to say move everything over to group space on day one. Um, if you've already got a website, great, keep it. Um, you can integrate group spaces with that. And so again, trying to just make it as easy as possible for people to sign up, which I think is really important if you're, if you're building a particular software or mobile company. Um, so, I'm not going to spend too long on this, this is just uh, a bit of a tour of the product, so you can see a nice easy dashboard when you log in. Um, this is our, our database that we've built online where you can import your Excel file, store your different members in lists for the committee, for teams, for the alumni so you can keep in touch with them. Send out nice professional looking emails to your members that are good for marketing events. And collect money online and, and track it in a simple dashboard, um, manage your events, invite people, we've got import and export between Facebook and group spaces to, to help with that, share files, put them in folders, um, manage your website and 
integrate with your own website if you so choose. Or what's that equals to 30? Um, so here's a, a bit of a timeline of uh, how we started. So launched at Oxford in October 07. Um, and this should give you some sense of how long startups will take. Um, January 08, we raised a, an angel round, £150,000, um, which allowed us to go from myself and my co-founder, Andy. Um, so backtracking a bit, I started Group Spaces with one other person who um, was the technical lead, um, Andy, being a computer science student, built the product and initially I focused on all of the other things involved with the marketing, the finance, the user support, the other things building the company. The £150,000 allowed us to go from the two of us to hiring, um, we hired one engineer from Imperial who moved up to Oxford to join us and another guy to help out with some of the sales and marketing. Fast forward a year, we opened to any university in the UK. Um, got to a thousand groups um, pretty fast. And then moving forward after we built a bit more momentum and got to uh, a good place for the product, raised $1.3 million from Index Ventures and who are the top VC in Europe um, here in Skype, that uh, last FM, MySQL, and a bunch of angel investors in both London and Silicon Valley, um, which was uh, really exciting for us. So it basically allowed us to go from up to 12 people now based over in Old Street. We moved to London after after we raised this round and uh, we've really grown fast since. Um, May last year, um, all of the undergrad societies are now forced to use group spaces, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and actually this is slightly out of date because today we've got over 30,000 groups on the product and it's growing exponentially. Um, this is some of our distribution across the UK. So I think today we've got about 40% of all clubs and societies at UK universities sign up to the product. That's Oxford, which is where we started. Um, and that's all I'll bore you with the group spaces. What I want to talk about now is some, some key lessons that we've learned along the way. Um, first of all, with ideas um, and how I think about coming up with ideas for startups. So the first question. I'm going to turn back over to you guys. How much is a startup idea worth? Put your hand up if you've got an idea. Just your average startup idea. It could be for, um, you know, for, for flocks, for group spaces, for Facebook. Yes? Nothing. Nothing. Genius. <laughs> right answer. Yeah, so, so I'd argue that startup ideas themselves are worth nothing. And the way that I'll prove this to you is to say that I still ask you another question. Has anyone ever heard of someone selling the idea for a new company um, to someone else for any amount of money? Just the idea, and then someone else has gone off and started the company. I've never ever heard an example where that has actually happened. Now markets mature very fast for any, any product or any, anything that you can buy. And so that would suggest that you know, they're actually not worth, on their own, very much. What's important is determination. Um, so, you can come up with an idea, but the key thing I would say, if you take away one thing from today, uh, from my talk, is that the key thing to build a successful startup or a successful company and be an entrepreneur is you just have to keep going. Stuff's going to screw up, your team's going to change, the idea's not going to work, you're going to get shut down by your university, like, you know, all this stuff's going to happen and get in your way, but if you keep going, you will reach success. The, the key thing is, is to keep going, and that is what's valuable. The like, stupidly determined nutcases like Zuckerberg or the PayPal guys or whoever, of Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, they're the guys that are super successful. So there's a, a good book that I'd encourage you to read, which is called Founders at Work. Now, it's basically 30, 35, 10 page um, interviews with founders of companies like Apple, PayPal, Twitter, uh, like the best technology companies of the last couple of decades, and it really brings down to earth like how completely clueless and stupid and um, ignorant these guys who are now super successful billionaires in some cases are <laughs> or were um, when they were like our age doing stuff, and uh, it makes this the prospect of you know building a big company a lot more real. And Jessica actually spoke to her about her book. She she intentionally ended the book with. 
uh, a quote from the founder of Dell, which says that the single most important thing required to be successful building a startup is persistence and determination. So, um, with group spaces, um, there's a point that I want to make, which is that building on this thing, that the initial idea is not the most valuable thing. One of the reasons for that is that the initial idea often changes. So with group spaces, we actually started out called Click Uni um, back in October 06. Um, some of you might know the story. And we were initially um, a portal where students could discover events from different clubs and societies at their university. But what we learned having launched that site was that the most prominent pain point that we'd, we'd found by launching this was that it was a complete pain in the ass to manage all the admin from clubs and societies. Hence, changing what we were doing into group spaces. If you look at PayPal as an example, they initially came up with the idea for PayPal because it was a pain to pay for the bill at a restaurant at the end of the night. And this was back in 2000 when everyone in Silicon Valley had a Palm Pilot mobile phone. And so what they did was build an app where you could split the bill on Palm Pilots. Um, the problem was that usually one out of the six people at the dinner table didn't have a Palm Pilot, so it was a stupid idea. <laughs> However, um, what they realized was that if they hooked up this mobile thing to this new concept called the internet back in 1999-2000, that would actually be really useful because people could pay, pay, pay other people over the internet. Uh, and hence PayPal came about and they sold it for $1.5 billion to eBay two years later. Um, and Microsoft started off trying to build programming language, uh, programming languages that they could sell and ended up with um, the desktop software that they now have and the operating systems and making money in places they didn't expect. Coming back to my previous point, what was the thing that all these, all these startups have in common is that they had determination, they kept going, the idea didn't actually work out in the way that they thought it would do, which will be the case probably if you guys start companies. But if you keep going, you will kind of tweak it and figure it out and hopefully reach something that makes sense. So don't worry too much about the initial idea. That said, you do need somewhere to start. Um, you need a hypothesis um, to start testing. And where I'd encourage you to start your journey is to look for something that's evil, broken, or stupid. Like, isn't it just like totally stupid that you can't go to a website and see where the fifties are in the library to see? <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's that's the place to start. Because struggling to come up with a startup idea, which are often people in the probably in this room who are like, you want to start a company, but I don't have an idea. That's a really lame excuse not to get going. Have a think. Here's a little brief to have a think about what sucks in your life. So that's a bit about startup ideas. Next thing I'll talk about is marketing in the context of startups. So often when people think about marketing traditionally, it's about big brand television advertising campaigns and spending lots of money on getting the word out there about what you do. Um, I'd argue that marketing is a lot more than that, and actually that is the less important, later stage, easier stuff. Put your hand up if you've heard of the phrase customer development. Good. If I'd have given this presentation three years ago, people would have been, what? Um, product development, what? So, um, the key principle with customer development is that what you don't want to do with, um, with a startup is come up with an idea, raise lots of money, spend lots of money on an idea, and realize that only six out of seven people at the average dinner table in Silicon Valley actually have a Palm Pilot and that's all a complete waste and went in the bin. What you want to do um, when you start off with an idea to make sure it works is get out of the building or your bedroom and start talking to the people who you think will be the potential customers for your service. Really get inside their heads, understand what they're doing. Um, ideally, that customer is you. You know, Rich knew that he wanted to find footy to sit next to the library. I knew that it was a pain in the ass to organize, um, organize a club or society. And then, to start with, what you want to do once you, you think you've got a specific problem that you can solve is, on a Thursday night, <laughs> build like the minimum thing that you can, 
you know, in, in some case, in most cases, it will take you know a, a period of several months to get something small out there. But just build the minimum viable product that you can to get out there and test your assumptions, test this idea that you think will work. Because as I've described, in a lot of cases, what you think initially isn't quite the case, but you might learn from it something that is really good. Uh, and so. You just if you can build something small that you know maybe is just applicable, for example, to students at UCL, um, then it allows you to test your concept out, start learning, improving it, and iterating, um, rather than spending lots of money and finding out later when you've wasted wasted a lot of time. So all of this method of thinking is summarised quite neatly in the context of building a software startup um, in a book called Four Steps to the Epiphany. Um, if any of you are thinking of building an internet or mobile software company, um, I highly recommend reading this book. It's one of the must-read things in Silicon Valley for an entrepreneur today. And the reason that I'm banging on about all that stuff is because there's one key thing that matters, um, one huge milestone um, that you want to get to when you start a company. Does anyone have the answer? What am I going to say? What's the only thing that matters um, when you start a company, or like the, the, the major milestone that you that you want to reach? Profit. Customers. People. Profit is a later milestone, I would argue. Um, that is definitely a milestone you want to ultimately reach. Yeah. Execution. Um, execution will get you there. The, the key thing is product market fit. And this is when you have built a product that actually solves a meaningful problem for people and, and satisfies them and they start using it. It's a slightly vague concept that I'm describing here. Um, but it's basically when you've got a product that really meets the needs of of the market that you're targeting. You've actually implemented your idea well and the product's working. Um, if you think of all successful companies, they'll have reached this milestone. And in a large number of cases, the unsuccessful ones won't have reached this milestone. If you build a product that people like using that works, in most cases, you'll be able to figure out a way to make money from it and make profit and, and get things to work. If you don't build a good product, like, you know, you've got no hope. Um, now, there's a, a really um, handy survey question that has been come up with by a guy called Sean Ellis, who writes a blog called Startup Marketing over in Silicon Valley, which um, helps you figure out whether you've reached product market fit. And he's, he's come up with this question as a result of um, speaking to a very large sample of startups. And if over 40% of your users or customers say that they would be very disappointed when given the choice of very disappointed, somewhat disappointed, not disappointed at all, um, if they could no longer use your product, it tends to mean you're there. You know, it basically, you could, if you turn it around, you've got something that people would describe as a must-have. Something that is a, a nice-to-have um, doesn't generally build a business. You need to build something that people need, that they, they must have. Um, it gets it's slightly fluffy when you're playing something that is, is an entertainment proposition and you're just giving people fun, which, which can be successful. But in most cases with software and mobile, you're, you're solving an actual problem to build a company. And the survey, free survey, where this is, is a, you can get it at survey.io. It's got this question and seven other really handy questions that we've used several times at Group Spaces. Now, in terms of actually building a company, um, this guy Sean, the marketer, has come up with a really helpful pyramid um, that I heavily subscribe to, where the first layer, which is why I said it's the first milestone that really matters, is to build the foundation of your company, get to product market fit. If you haven't got a product that works, like you know, you, you're not gonna. There's no point in in trying to go further up this. Um, get the product nailed. When you've got a product that's working, then the next phase is promise. What's promise? Promise is about messaging and describing to future potential customers or users 
um, what the benefits are of your product. Now, on day one, you can do this. You can write the messaging and make your promises. The problem is that um, it, it's likely to be the case that the benefits that people actually get from your product are slightly different, or your customers would describe them slightly differently to um, how you initially think they would. But once you've got product market fit, here's the cheat. You can ask the people who say they'd be very disappointed if they could no longer use your product, what benefits they're getting. And you can use the language that they use to describe the benefits that they're getting as your marketing. And then, all these potential customers are going to completely understand why they should use your product. Um, so that's the promise phase. Um, just getting that marketing messaging now so that when people come across your product, they understand why they should use it. Um, the next phase um, is the economics. And so this is, you know, coming back to your question about profit or making money, um, and this is a slightly biased Silicon Valley mentality, um, but I think is with mobile and software startups is, is the way to do things in general. Um, then worry about the business model. Once you've got a product that works, you've figured out how to get more people to use it because you've got the messaging right and they like it. Then when you know what shape your product is and why people are using it and what benefits they're getting from it, then you can try and extract the value from it from the place that you know has value as opposed to thinking at the start that you could maybe you know, make some money from something that you know, you're not really sure will actually happen. Um, it's a much safer way of knowing you're going to make money and it also reduces you from getting distracted early on. Once you've got the business model sorted, then you can start tweaking it, optimizing it, measuring it. Um, measurement is something I, I can't overemphasize as well here. In that, um, in order to figure out you know what, what's working well with your products, you want to be looking at all of the data that your users are, are giving you. Um, and then, when people are signing up to it and upgrading and paying, really you know just immersing yourself in the data to help you optimize it and get the numbers working is key. And then you can start raising silly amounts of money and just scaling the crap out of the company. And um, so, coming back to um, these ideas, um, there's another principle that I want to encourage you to do um, with, with building the ideas, and that's to start niche. Um, so, let's look at a case study. Uh, and this is coming back to my point about building the minimum viable product. Um, you don't, you're not going to take over the world on day one with a startup idea. Uh, and I think particularly when you're in university, um, that's an obvious niche to go for as rich, Facebook, I have done, uh, and, and there's a lot of other similar examples. Google, Yahoo started in universities as well. Um, so what Facebook did was figure out a problem they could solve for Harvard students get that minimum viable product for them, and then once they nailed that, got the product market fit, then they started expanding it out. If they tried to take on the whole world on day one, probably would have worked in the same way. And so it's, it's much easier basically to start niche, solve a problem for a very specific segment of people, and then broaden it out than it is to kind of be everything to everyone on, on day one. So I'd encourage you to, to think that way when you try and get your ideas out there. Uh, and then, in terms of the, so the first thing I said that really matters is, is getting to product market fit. When you go further up that pyramid, the second thing, uh, the second the huge milestone um, that companies reach is when their cost of customer acquisition, the amount of money that you pay to get a new customer is lower than the amount of money that you actually get from the customer. Because that difference, that's profit. And so, once you've got product market fit, got that nailed, then going up the pyramid, building the business model, getting that in there, that, they're the two key ingredients for building a company. If you can get product market fit, get the customer acquisition cost lower than the lifetime value, then you're set. So this is some of the stuff we've been thinking about a lot of group spaces recently. And um, yeah, I, I'm probably the world's expert at what an Excel spreadsheet looks like. Um, and when it comes to, to figuring this out, there's lots of different customer acquisition channels available to you. Here's a range of, of things you can try. 
Um, and ultimately, the, the thing you need to, to focus on is measuring and looking at the numbers. You know, at the start, you don't know how much it's going to cost to acquire a group by Google AdWords versus buying a group by you know hiring a team to go to a freshers' fair versus um, trying to do a partnership with a big organization. Like, the numbers involved in these different channels, you're only going to learn by trying them, measuring them, looking at the data, and, and then iterating. So I think given the time, uh, and given that questions for me are usually more useful than hearing me ramble, um, I'm not going to go on to, to talking about finance, but I'm, I'm really happy to um, answer questions about raising finance. The last thing I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through for you is just sharing um, sharing how we do our marketing and group spaces is just some examples of the things that we figured out work for us. So um, the best way of marketing if you can is by spending no money on customer acquisition because then if you make any money out of your customers it's profit. Um, so with group spaces it's great because a leader creates a group. Um, the as part of creating a group, you import your members, you import the members of the society. Some of the members of the society are leaders, presidents, treasurers of other groups. And then what they'll do is experience the product, see how it works, see that you've got nice newsletters or the event management you know, seems, seems really useful. And they'll create groups for other things that they run. Uh, and with Facebook, when you sign up to Facebook, if none of your friends are there, it's useless, so you want to invite all your friends there, um, and then they invite their friends there, and there's that viral loop. So, um, ideally, if you can, you want to make your product viral. It's not possible in all cases, or it's not possible in all, in all cases um, to grow the company fast enough via this channel. So, what we also do with group spaces is we seed the product by going out there and spending money on some different channels. Things that we do, we partner with networks of groups like. Um, we partnered with UCL Union a couple of years ago to, to get groups um, at UCL using it. We partnered with a lot of student unions, um, national networks of societies, um, SIF, Engineers Without Borders, NACUA, some organizations you might have heard of that we work with. Then we um, do some paid advertising online using AdWords, Facebook ads, um, where it's pretty cheap these days and you can measure them well. Um, we've done a lot of stuff at Freshers' Fairs where we have an ambassador program that students can join and run around their Freshers' Fairs getting as many people to sign up as they can at the start of the year. And uh, we do some, some direct sales for, for very large groups. And uh, I'm going to skip all this stuff and leave you. So, this is just a summary of the resources that I'm, I've mentioned throughout the talk. Um, VentureHacks.com is the, the resource that I rate most highly on the web about raising funding for startups. Um, so uh, the other things I've already talked about. Here. And I'll leave you to ask you some questions. Thanks very much, David. A lot of interesting content. Um, yeah, we open for questions. Yeah, yeah just wondering who's your rival? Uh, do, is there any rival company? So, it's an interesting question for group spaces. We don't have like an obvious other big successful group management company. Um, what we're really competing with is where the, most of the world is today, which is running their groups off Excel spreadsheets, a random mailing list on university server, cash and checks, crappy websites. Um, people will have a Facebook group, although it does so little that it's you know it's not really what, what I'm calling it a competitor. It's just kind of this mishmash of tools is where people are today. So our challenge is not so much competing with some other company to say, hey, use our suite of group management tools, not theirs. It's use a group, you know, use our suite per se um, because it's easier than using all this mishmash of crap that you're currently using, um, which is yeah, how we think about the market. Then a lot of these tools are technologically more advanced. Like for example, I mean, I guess if, if I focus only on, on managing my, my data, like different different files, then something like Dropbox is just a little more convenient. But well, the, the problem is that um, you know, for managing files, there's Dropbox. For managing email lists, there's email marketing companies like Mailchimp. For managing events, you've got event management sites. The key thing is that 
if you're trying to organize a group that holds lots of events and needs an email list and needs a membership database and wants to store files, you could either have like six logins to six different websites and have your data all over the place and have it out of sync um, with arguably like slightly more advanced functionality for the individual ones because that's all these companies do. But in our experience, it's much, much less efficient for the group and uh, you know, it's a nightmare experience to mesh, mesh all these things together, which is really the value proposition that we provide is, is bringing, um, bringing these separate tools that are available elsewhere into one place and it's just so much easier to give you know, all the committee access to one place where all the data is stored. So yeah, I, mean, yeah, I know the guys at Dropbox, great company there. Um, they may be announcing some, some extremely big news soon. Um, <laughs> might have a, uh, a, I think, 9, 10, 11 figure number, I don't know, whatever. But uh, anyway, <laughs> yeah, better than anyone. So, yes? How did you go about hiring the third person? I mean, by that, I mean, presumably you had no experience in interviewing candidates. It was actually an event like just like this. So, <laughs> the guy at Imperial Entrepreneurs, who was their IT officer, who was like here sorting out the presentations for someone about four years, three or four years ago at an event, um, was a developer who'd set up his own little um, web design agency at uni and was graduating that year and asked him if he had a job at, during drinks afterwards, so here's a tip for when you're napping afterwards. <laughs> he, said, uh, he said, no, no, I don't. Uh, I'm interviewing with this video conferencing company next week. I was like, oh right, that sounds boring, do you want to come and work for us? Uh, and he said, yeah, alright then. I said, okay, cool. Um, <laughs> now, I said to him after that that, you know, we're going to have to go through an interview process. I had no idea how actually good he was at coding at this point. I just you know, heard a couple of good things. Um, and then he ended up having a couple of interviews with my co-founder, Andy, who, who leads our development. Turned out he was really good. And uh, a few months later, he graduated and, and moved up to join us. Um, so I think the more useful lesson than a stupid story here is um, where we find candidates in general for hiring and where you could potentially find people to work with on a startup. And so the best place, if you can, is through your own network, through people you know, friends, friends of friends, where you can get, you either know them already or they're a trusted referral, where your friend who you trust says, yeah, this guy's good. And that exchange of trust is key and also it's free to hire by your own network. Um, and LinkedIn is kind of a, an online extension where you can leverage your network a bit more to, to see other people you know. So I, I definitely um, suggest that first. Um, in I'm guessing a lot of people in the room cases here, if you're the non-technical co-founder looking for a developer, um, and going to the computer science faculty at UCL and emailing the mailing list um, there it will often work and getting making sure that people who do have the skills to complement yours um, know about what you're doing. Um, then I mean, for us, what we also do now, and this is more relevant when you've raised more funding, um, is that we use, use headhunters to, to help us with, with finding people. Um, the catch there is that market rate for headhunters in London to find developers is 15% of the first year salary. You can do the maths, it's pretty painful. But when you've raised a million bucks in funding, it's optimal to, to do things that way. Um, so, yeah, use your network, use LinkedIn, and um, my other experience with hiring is that job boards suck. Like, posting an ad on a job board that people will apply to, it, with a very small number of exceptions, um, crunch board, tech crunches job board, I would select out and a couple of other very niche ones. Mostly the people who apply to jobs on job boards are exclusively the people that you don't want to hire and they just waste your time reading crap applications. Um, so you know, don't rely on job boards would be one of my, my other, other tips for hiring unless they are very specialist um, and you know that they've got good people reading them. And, yeah. Okay. Yes? Um, Karine, when you very first started and Karine got your first investment, did you need much money if so where did it come from? So I haven't talked about our business model with group spaces. Um, you were just trusted that we must make money in some way. We raised all this in venture capital. Um, it's not always the case. We actually do make some money. Um, so um, our business model um, is threefold. Um, the actual first revenue stream we had was advertising. So what we did with group spaces was we um, went out and uh, hustled the graduate recruiters at careers fairs where they came down and were, had their stand saying, hey, do you want a job with Nomura, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs? And I was like, 
No, but would you like to buy some adverts on this website? <laughs> and this is actually the same thing that I said when they offered me a job after the internship. Um, they're like, would you like to take the job with us? And I was like, well, no, but would you like to buy some adverts on the website that I'm starting instead? Um, JP Morgan were our second client, which I was particularly good as well. Um, but um, so to start with, what we did was, um, it was not a large amounts of money. It was maybe, I think we made about £20,000 in income from graduate recruitment advertising. It's comparable with the sponsorship you might get for society, like you know, a couple, a couple of thousand pounds, three thousand pounds, four thousand pounds for, for a deal at a university that we we're able to get, and so that was actually helpful for us to start with in terms of. Um, I think it was six months after I graduated um, from raising the first round of funding. So in terms of like giving Andy and I some living costs to do that, um, we, we generated a, a little bit of, of revenue there. Um, I don't think that's. A must have by any means for raising any investment, as you know, Rich has shown, and, and you know, even without such incredible growth that you had, um, I think it's very possible to, to raise the angel investment um, there. We, we had some. Um, another thing that I hadn't mentioned that I would I'd definitely consider if I was in your position now looking to do a startup are incubators. Um, so, Y Combinator, Seedcam, Techstars, that some of you guys might have heard of, um, are three month programs in general where you get given a very small amount of investment um, and ranging from I think it's 50,000 euros at seed count, Y Combinator initially was about $20,000 based over in Silicon Valley, they've extended that now to giving you $20,000 of investment-ish um, and $150,000 convertible loan on your first round of funding which is kind of ridiculous considering that you might join not even having much of an idea, um, but that's great for you guys if you get in. Um, so, uh, in terms of a source of initial capital, I'd encourage you to check out Y Combinator, Seedcamp, and, and Techstars. Seedcamp's in London, Y Combinator in the Valley, Techstars at a few other locations in the US. They'll all accept applications from people like you guys in London. Yes. One more question, though. Um, yes. Sir. Um, when you started this idea, when you got it going, how did you plan? I mean, you said that there are a lot of things that can affect your ideas when you get them going, so how do you make your bed flexible? Um, it's a good question. I think one of the most difficult things for entrepreneurs to do uh, is say no. Uh, and the reason being is that you have to be um, delusional, um, delusionally optimistic in order to think that you can start a company in the first place. And so you're very optimistic and want to say yes to like, you know, things happening, very positive people in general with startup ideas. Now the problem is that if you say yes to all the things that you think you can do when you do a startup, you end up not doing any of them optimally because there are too many potential things that you need to do. And so um, I think the key thing in terms of how we plan was that you have to prioritize really, really ruthlessly. Like what, what's the thing that matters? Getting to product market fit. Okay, so that's like at the beginning, like building the product. So. Like, one of the things was like Andy was because he was out the two of us, the only person who was building the product, he had nothing else. Like, you know, it was just, I, I would like take everything away from him so he could just focus on building the product. Um, and then what did we prioritize early on? Getting as much feedback as we could, um, like going out, talking to people, what was their experience, did they like it, why did they like it, what else did they want, um, and then taking that feedback, interpreting it feeding it back into the product development so that we built those things, we improved the product, and just you know, trying to you know, get a good product. Uh, and, and at the start, I, like I said, that's, that's the key thing that matters. Um, we, the, other, the other thing that um, you need to focus on, um, otherwise the company can't sustain itself, um, is you need to figure out funding. So um, you know, if, you, if you don't have a good product, the company will die. Um, Eventually, if you don't have um, enough money in the bank, then you can't pay people and you can't keep working on it. So, so that's another potential cause of death for the company too. So making sure that, that we had money in the bank, whether that was going and selling some ads or getting an angel round at the bank, um, were kind of key things at the top of my list early on, as well as getting, getting feedback and getting enough early users on board such that we could test things out. Cool.